This is Earth Files, the award-winning news site with the latest updates in science, environment, and real X-Files. Podcasting in-depth reports beyond the 6 o'clock news by Emmy Award-winning journalist Linda Moulton Howe. In my previous February 23, 2007 Earth Files and Coast to Coast AM news updates about the mysterious honeybee disappearances, I interviewed a Pennsylvania honey beekeeper who has had nearly 2,000 of his 2,900 hives disappear. That's a 60% loss to date. That is David Hackenberg of Hackenberg Apiary in Pennsylvania. He said he had never seen so many deserted hives that were also left alone by predator moths and beetles. That's why he suspects some kind of pesticide is getting into the flower pollen and nectar and poisoning the hives. He contacted Penn State's bee experts to investigate. To date, there is no answer, and bees are still disappearing. This March of 2007, honey beekeepers in the colder latitudes of Ohio and Pennsylvania have begun to reopen hives to find continuing devastating losses, up to 80% to 90% in some Ohio bee colonies. Over the past six months, massive disappearances of honeybees have been reported in at least 24 states, internationally in Poland and Spain, and it's still unknown how many more honeybees will be gone as more northern hives are opened this spring in North America and Europe. Right now, dozens of scientists are trying to find out what is causing what they call Colony Collapse Disorder, or CCD. I talked with Penn State entomologist Diana Cox Foster, Ph.D. She has analyzed some bees found in deserted hives. Dr. Cox Foster has seen as many as five different viruses and unidentified fungi in those bees. She says that is two times more pathogens than she's ever seen before in honeybees. The implication is that something has seriously damaged their immune systems, leaving the honeybees more vulnerable to disease than before. But what could that be? So far, there are still no answers, but there is a long list of possibilities, which include pesticides and genetically modified crops, also known as GMOs or GMs. Scientists say there is no direct evidence that genetically modified crops are linked to honeybee die-offs. But I have been learning that not much is known about the accumulating impact of pesticides on insects, animals, and even people when you consider in this modern world how many combinations of pesticides are used. One pesticide by itself might not destroy honeybees. But what happens when farmers spray herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and rodenticides on land that also has genetically modified crops with pesticides built in? The United States grows nearly two-thirds of all genetically engineered crops. Last year, about 130 million acres were planted with GMs. Much of the soy, corn, cotton, and canola have had a gene inserted into their DNA to produce pesticides systemically throughout the plants, and those are created and patented by Monsanto Corporation. Monsanto also produces genetically modified crops designed not to die when herbicides are sprayed on them. In a perfect biotech world, only the weeds would be killed. But Mother Nature has a way of outwitting human designs. So now the weeds are becoming resistant to the herbicide sprays, and frustrated farmers are putting on more and more poisons to kill the weeds. One American plant pathologist who is very concerned about the herbicide-resistant weeds is Doug Gurian Sherman, Ph.D., and now a senior scientist in the Food and Environment Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C. Previously, between 1995 and 2000, Dr. Gurian Sherman was a staff scientist at the Environmental Protection Agency, where he evaluated risks and safety of pesticides and genetically modified crops. I asked him about the possible impact of accumulating pesticides on honeybees. It's hard to know what the ramification might be for bees, 
but one of the two main types of genetically engineered crops, and the one most widely planted in the U.S. and around the world, are herbicide-tolerant crops, and especially herbicide-tolerant soybeans. At least 85, probably a higher percentage of the soybeans in the U.S. are resistant to a particular type of herbicide called glyphosate. The trade name of the most common type is called Roundup. And what this trait does is allows a farmer to spray the herbicide right on the crop, which would have killed the crop, would have killed the soybeans prior to the introduction of this gene. The gene comes from a type of bacteria that is found in the soil, and it makes the plant basically immune to the herbicide. The consequence of this is that glyphosate and Roundup, which is sold by Monsanto, which also sells the seed of the type of soybeans, that are immune or resistant to the herbicide. That herbicide has become the most widely used herbicide now in the world. And the consequence of that is you have one particular herbicide that's used on a tremendous amount of acreage in the U.S. and elsewhere, especially Argentina and Brazil, as any biologist would expect. When you have such tremendous pressure on weeds to try to survive this herbicide. Some of the weeds that are resistant, all their competition is basically killed off, and these resistant weeds then proliferate and can no longer be controlled by glyphosate. So now you have a situation where the use of this herbicide has gone up, and on probably millions of acres, other herbicides are having to be used as well as glyphosate in order to control the resistant weeds. So what we've been seeing in the last few years is the overall level of herbicides, herbicide use increasing on these crops, and it will almost inevitably continue to increase. And in this case, causing the rise of these resistant weeds and the increased use of herbicides and potentially maybe harming amphibians to boot. And the honeybees. And with the creation of these Frankenstein crops and Frankenstein weeds, isn't emerging a major question about the accumulation, that no one really knows the answer to how much is too much for earth life, and that the piling on of herbicides now against resistant weeds made resistant through the application of genetically modified herbicides, you are increasing pesticides out there in the world with unknown consequences? Well, certainly, when the Environmental Protection Agency registers pesticides, it does quite a bit of testing. But even though that testing does reveal potential risks and does have a lot of value, it certainly also has substantial limits. And one of those limits is that we really don't often have a good handle on how the interaction between different pesticides can affect organisms. And that's really not considered or tested by EPA. Another bee expert at the University of California in Davis has discovered that some EPA-approved fungicides that don't kill adult honeybees do kill bee larvae and young bees. Eric Musson, Ph.D., is an entomologist and extension apiculturist at UC Davis. He is concerned that some EPA approval criteria only applies to adult honeybees and does not protect the young If you have something like a fungicide which doesn't hurt an adult bee when it's sprayed with it or hits it in the field, then they just think it's safe for honeybees. And in some cases, that hasn't been the truth. Not too long ago, I ran some experiments in the lab and found out that two of the fungicides that are commonly used out here for controlling diseases on the almond trees, if you got too much of it into the larval food of honeybees, it killed the larvae. And the bottom line is that currently the Environmental Protection Agency has testing regulations that are applied to the adult bee, but you're finding that those levels that EPA accepts are killing the brood and the young bees. That's only happened in a few chemicals, but I guess the answer to that is yes. And what we were hoping would be that there would also have to be some kind of data generated before a registration was processed that talked about what happened if it got into the food of the immatures. Now, when you explained the research that you did and what you found to EPA, what did EPA say? Well, they said they wanted to see some evidence 
or some data. So I sent them the evidence, and I cannot see that anything has changed since that. That was a couple of years ago. In the past six years, a new group of nicotine-based pesticides have emerged called neonicotinoids. The most common is imidacloprid. Ironically, these were originally manufactured to be less lethal. But about four years ago, French and Italian beekeepers complained that imidacloprid crop spraying was killing their honeybees. So the French and Italian governments banned the nicotine-based pesticides. American scientists now studying the colony collapse disorder wrote in their first preliminary report that even though the neonicotinoids will not kill adult bees directly on flowers and plants, lab research shows, quote, if bees are eating fresh or stored pollen contaminated with these chemicals at low levels, the pesticides might not cause mortality but might impact the bee's ability to learn or make memories. If this is the case, young bees leaving the hives to make orientation flights might not be able to learn the location of the hive and might not be returning, causing the colonies to dwindle and eventually die, unquote. I asked Jerry Hayes, chief of the apiary section for Florida's Department of Agriculture in Gainesville, about the nicotine-based pesticide's ability to disable honeybee memory. The interesting thing about the colony collapse disorder is, of course, bees are leaving the colony and not coming back, which is highly unusual for a social insect to leave a queen and its brood or its young behind. So they seemingly are going out, can't find their way back home. The uh, metacloprid, when it's used to control termites, does exactly the same thing. One of the methods it uses to kill termites is that the termites feed on this material and then go out to feed and can't remember how to get home. And then it also uh, causes their immune system to collapse, causing what would be normal organisms to become pathogenic in them. Have farmers been using imidacloprid more than they have in the past? Well, I think a couple of things. I think its use has changed. Uh, first, it started out as a, a seed treatment to protect the seed as it germinated and developed. Uh, now it's being used as a foliar spray. It's being used as a systemic. It's being combined with fungicides, which increases its efficacy. And so its use has changed. And especially systemically, it does what it's supposed to do. It takes care of agricultural pests, which we want it to do. But there seems to be a disconnect sometimes that researchers and horticulturists forget that a honeybee is an insect. Then, of course, there are other insects out there that are valuable pollinators as well. So systemically, this material uh, is found in the nectar, in many cases in low doses, not something that would kill a honeybee. So the question is, what does chronic exposure uh, to the honeybee as an adult, or as the bees bring this material back to the nest to store and feed to developing young bees over time, what does chronic exposure uh, do to the colony? Scientists say there is no direct evidence that genetically modified crops are linked to honeybee die-offs. But beyond the honeybees, something is killing all the pollinators. Pollinators include honeybees, bumblebees, hornets, wasps, butterflies, hummingbirds, and even bats. Something is happening in the environment that is causing all of those different species to decline in North America and currently the most dramatic event is the massive disappearance of honeybees. Jerry Hayes, chief of the apiary section for Florida's Department of Agriculture in Gainesville, told me he was asked in 2006 to speak before the National Academy of Sciences about the serious decline of North American pollinators. I was able to make a presentation to the National Academy of Sciences last year and They uh, produced a report about the loss of pollinators in North America. The uh, federal government asked the National Academy of Sciences to look at this from a strategic standpoint. How much of our food production do we want to turn over to other countries that may be friendly now and not friendly in the future, similar to our energy production problems right now? So the federal government is looking at this, and my question is, are honeybees the canary in the coal mine? What are honeybees trying to tell us? that we as humans should be paying more attention to. This is the most dramatic losses that I've seen in my career. I think I've heard 80% losses. 
I think they lost 400,000 colonies in Poland and 600,000 in Spain or something like that. We have about 280,000 colonies registered in the state of Florida. Of that, we're projecting a loss uh, between 35 and 45 percent of those. What insects can you think of that man has a relationship with? There aren't too many. And honeybees have had a relationship with man for thousands of years. It has been beneficial to both species. And now that is highly in jeopardy. Could we be looking at food shortages at the end of 2007? I suppose if this continued, so then the question is, who fills in the gap and do we become reliant on them? I think I read a figure, the USDA projected by 2015 or something like that, that 40% of our vegetables would be coming from China. So the transition's already taking place, and uh, what does this mean for consumers? If they can still get food in the grocery store and the price is the same, who cares about the honeybees? But that comes back to your presentation at the National Academy of Sciences and the interest of national security. If we end up losing our pollinators in North America and we're dependent upon China, South America, and other countries that politically may become difficult in the future, what would happen to the U.S. food supply? Exactly. The Central Intelligence Agency had reported several years ago that Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda had a big grip on the honeybee industry in the Middle East and extending to Afghanistan, Pakistan, and that region of the world. Do you think there's any possibility that this honeybee disappearance could be related to some sort of bioterrorism on the part of Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda? Well, yeah, I don't know if those guys are smart enough to pull something like that off. Did that issue ever come up on the record or off the record at the National Academy of Sciences? Um, Not that I uh, remember. certainly has gone through my mind. Does it surprise you that since October of 2006, when the disappearance was becoming publicly reported and massive, that there still is not an answer by March of 2007? Yes. (laughs) We have a lot of incredibly smart people who know honeybees, who know toxicology, who know funguses and yeasts and what have you, working on this and analyzing this. And I would have thought that we would have had one of those aha moments of here it is. So when you don't have an aha moment, that tells me that it's something so brand new that we can't identify it or that there are uh, multiple things intersecting causing the problem. A follow-up to Jerry Hayes' comments about the nicotine-based pesticides was in another important finding about the unpredictable impact that combinations of pesticides can have. It was discussed in the Colony Collapse Disorder Working Group's first preliminary report of December 15, 2006. Quote, A study in North Carolina found that some of the widely used neonicotinoids in combination with certain widely used fungicides such as TerraGuard and Procure, synergize to increase the toxicity of the neonicotinoid over 1,000 times in lab studies. Unquote. Thanks for listening to this Earth Files podcast from the edges of science, environment, and real X-Files. Go to www.earthfiles.com to see more than a thousand Earth Files reports with photographs, drawings, and documents. And visit Earth Files every day, every week, for new reports and new podcasts. That's www.earthfiles.com. 